So without further ado, we are now going to go to the Beatrice Bacardi Lecture. Um, and each year, the CBA hosts the Beatrice Bacardi Lecture in memory of our former secretary from 1949 to 1973. We are not only indebted to her founding role, but also her contribution to archaeology, both in the UK and overseas. So it is with great delight that we are joined today by Dr. Amara Thornton, Research Fellow at the Institute of Classical Studies, University of London, and co-investigator of the three-year AHRC-funded project, Beyond Notability, re-evaluating women's work in archaeology, history, and heritage, between the years of 1870 and 1970. So we are in our 80th year and in memory of Beatrice Ducardi, we are delighted that she will be talking to us about her project Beyond Notability and how we can link the stories of archaeology's workers to a variety of institutions to read a richer, more detailed, con contextualised history of us and our enthusiasm for the past. So before Amara takes over, which you will in a minute, if you want to ask any questions at the end of the lecture, please put the questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat, and um, I'll pick them up at the end. So take it away, Amara. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. <clears throat> There we go. Okay. So can everyone see that? It's not, okay. Hopefully it's all fine. Can everyone hear me okay? Can you just... Yes, that's perfect, Tamara. We can see Fantastic. you and see you. Thank you so much, Neil. Okay, so um, I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you so much for inviting me um, for this lecture named for Beatrice Ducardi, who is um, one of the many, many women we have been researching as part of Beyond Notability. She comes in towards the end of the period we're focusing on, which ends in 1950, uh, and she got her start in archaeology, as many of you know, I'm aware, in the 1930s. So in this lecture, I'm going to be exploring the context of women in archaeology, um, broadly defined, out of which Ducardi emerged, the stories of women on whose shoulders Ducardi stood, if I can put it like that. And at the end of it, I hope you'll be able to see Ducardi within a sea of other women, many of whose stories are yet to be told. And I hope you'll be inspired to help uh, to use some archaeological terms, excavate and resurface more stories of women in archaeology in the past. Um, just to quickly introduce us and our, um, our uh, the team of the project, um, we have um, PI Catherine Harlow, who's the director of the Institute of Classical Studies, um, Professor James Baker, who is um, head of digital humanities at Southampton, um, myself, and then two postdoctoral researchers, um, Dr. Amandeep Mahal and um, Dr. Sharon Howard, who are both at Southampton. And um, also we've got some fantastic interns working with us as well. Um, on the right hand side of your screen, you can see a screenshot of our website and the website address below that. Um, this is the way to connect to the database that I'm referring to a lot during the course of today's talk. Um, you can see I've circled in red um, the where you can get to the database um, from the website. That's probably the best way to get into it. And then you can search from, from there. And it's worth saying as I talk um, that um, you can look up entries for the women I'll be mentioning today. Our database is publicly accessible and searchable right now, and I'll be showing you an example of the kinds of information we capture as I go along. Um, and uh, you can use, in order to sort of find connections within the data, you can use uh, the, um, on the left, on the right-hand side of the screen in the database, there's a, um, a hot link that says what links here, and that's how you can start to explore the data in a bit more detail. So, oh, that didn't work. Here's the big picture. 
Um, we have over 400, 4,000, sorry, entries overall in our database, over 800 women um, and a whole bunch of other linked societies, um, uh, higher education institutions, excavations, museums, international conferences and commissions. And all of those are associated with, all the, with the women in our database. Um, these figures are constantly changing. So this is a sort of approximate um, number, but it's relatively close to the numbers that we have today. We have as our main project record, three sets of different archives, the Royal Archaeological Institute, the Society of Antiquaries, who are our partners on the project, um, and the records of the Congress of Archaeological Societies, which operated in unison with the Society of Antiquaries. Um, the Congress of Archaeological Societies was effectively the forerunner to the CBA, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as I go through the, um, the lecture today. So this slide gives you a sense of the sorts of material we're looking at. There's a lot of different types of data here, and each type of data gives you slightly different information. So we had to think about how we could accommodate that difference um, in the database. That is one of the main outputs of the project. The types of records listed here um, don't all cover the same period either. So our period of focus is 1870 to 1950, and only some of the records on this slide go back as far as 1870, and only some stretch to 1950. I should also say that we haven't looked at all of this material. We need a much long, larger project um, to do that. We've kind of concentrated on minute books mainly and some correspondence, and we've then augmented that <clears throat> by um, other primary and secondary source material. As you might imagine, there are um, lots of overlaps between these three sets of archives. They complement each other um, and studying them in parallel then enables you to see overlapping networks and pick up traces of people across the three different types of records here. So, this is a screenshot from a query that runs through our database. Um, and it shows you the geographical spread of women whose work was featured in um, the annual indexes of the Congress of Archaeological Societies. Um, the Congress produced annual indexes of archaeological papers, which covered a wide range of disciplines, not just archaeology, between 1890 and 1907 and then a further big volume that stretched back to the 17th century um, and stopped in 1890. So by using both of those sources together, we were able to extract the names of about 250 women from who were, whose work were, were featured in either the big volume or in these um, annual indexes that were produced by the Congress. Over the course of the project, we have tried to find addresses for these women where it was possible to find addresses. Um, as you may be aware, many local society journals published members lists which had addresses um, in the journals that were uh, published you know, a century ago or, or so. And this was incredibly helpful for us to be able to place women whose work was being published in a specific locality and attach them to particular local societies and networks. So in our database, if you're interested in a particular society, you can look it up and see using the what links here um, link that I mentioned earlier, you can see which women are associated in with that society in our database. Um, the Congress's annual indexes and the, the big volume that I mentioned were also um, help us, uh, the, the Congress gave us a list of women, but the list of women's names only were last names and usually titles, very few first names or initials. So in order to find the person, the addresses became critical. Um, and there was another source that we turned to as well to try and get a sense of the women who were active in archaeology, and that was um, the Congress's 
Earthworks Committee. The Earthworks Committee was a, a, a subcommittee of the General Congress. It produced annual reports from about 1906 to 1939. And these included information on ongoing excavations, destruction and preservation, as well as bibliographies listing published papers. Um, so we found quite a few women mentioned in the Congress's Earthworks Committee reports, effectively stretching our list of women whose work appeared in print in scholarly journals through the 1930s. So it was a, a way for us to continue the information that had been put into the indexes. Um, the Congress's indexes are also one of the, the base sources for the archaeology data services, services person IDs. So in our database, we've linked women to their um, sometimes multiple ADS IDs as part of the project. In doing this, we're able to put women's full names to ADS records where the bibliographic information is title and surname or title initials and surname. So it gives a, a sense of the person again. Um, this map shows where women who were associated with the Royal Archaeological Institute were living, um, again, using the addresses uh, in the journal. This map includes people who were, who were members of the RAI during our period of focus, but also people um, who were publishing in the archaeological journal who might not have been um, members. It also includes women who were noted as speaking at the Archaeological Institute. Um, or having their papers read by someone else at meetings or noted as exhibiting something. So when we set out to build our database, we made the decision to keep different kinds of what we called public and professional activities separate from each other. So if a woman spoke at a meeting and exhibited something, those two activities would be accounted for separately. Um, equally, if they spoke at a meeting and their paper was later published, those two activities would be accounted for separately. In this way, we're able to include women who are taking part in the activities of societies who may or may not have been members, women who are speaking at meetings, but not necessarily having those papers published in journals. This process has enabled us to be much more inclusive in our scope of women's work in archeology, span history, and heritage. So it's not just about the final published paper. We're interested in the work that builds up to that final product as well. Um, we're also attempting to keep track of the sort of social and economic context of the women uh, who are coming through in our database. And um, we have a number of ways of tracking this context, but one of them is by ensuring that we link them where relevant to historic houses that they may be associated with. For the most part, when we classify something as a historic house, it means a pretty large house with a large plot of land uh, or an estate of some kind that's attached to it. Um, these houses may have been owned by the woman herself or inherited through the family or home that she's living in through marriage. Um, so some sort of um, address that's attached to this woman um, that indicates that she had a, a deep association with this place. Um, for some women on our, in our database, these houses and the lands associated with them were critical <clears throat> to their work. So women were researching, presenting, and publishing, for example, on manuscripts or collections of artifacts or fine and decorative art that were held in these houses. Or there were archaeological sites on land that they and their families owned when that the women were involved in excavating and or publicizing. We have linked into external databases for historic properties in most cases, indicating that houses have been given, given grade listing status, for example, in England. We also have a number of houses in Scotland and Ireland, so we're linking to the appropriate databases for those as well. We also have a number of historic houses that have um, been demolished over, over the course of time, and uh, we still create those as entries just to again, show this um, social and economic context. So um, in our database, excavations are treated as organizations. 
most excavations are created as separate entries so that we can link people, organizations, and committees who are involved in working on facilitating or funding excavation work. In our excavation entries, people who are named as working on excavations are listed alongside the director, for example, and other people such as landowners giving permission um, for the work to occur. This enables us to include a variety of roles on excavations beyond the usual uh, credit to the director. In our database, we have nearly 50 women who are directing excavations across our period and roughly double that working as members of excavations. So um, this just gives you an example of how this appears on our database is the screenshot from the database um, showing an entry or part of an entry, I should say, for a woman called Nora Jolliffe. Um, Nora Jolliffe studied classics at Girton um, College, Cambridge, and then became a lecturer in classics at the University of Reading um, or University College Reading, as it then was um, in the 1920s. I first came across her in relation to work I was doing on the origins of the University of Reading's Year Museum. Uh, originally, the Year Museum, which is a mainly classical collection, um, as in um, classical Greece uh, collection, um, had incorporated a Romano British collection as well. And that collection was something that Nora Jolliffe was the curator of while she was at Reading. Um, Jolliffe also took part in the 1930s excavations at Colchester alongside a number of other women, um, including Thalassa uh, Crusoe, who worked, uh, co-directed with Nora Jolliffe at, um, I'm sorry, at Whittem. Um, and we can note in our database, as you can see here, specific roles and tasks for which women are credited. So in the case of uh, Nora Jolliffe at Colchester, she's doing a lot of work um, relating to pottery and small finds and cataloging and cleaning um, an incredible amount of pottery alongside a number of other women, I should say. Um, we also um, have maps uh, using our data uh, to pull together locations of archaeological sites that are represented um, in the work that women are doing in our database. Um, this shows you the sites that are associated with women, and we create, create separate entries for sites uh, on our database, and we put in where we can find them, site IDs uh, via English Heritage in England, Canmore in Scotland, and Cadu in, in Wales. Um, I should say here that this map doesn't represent all the sites in our database, it's just the ones that have coordinates on Wikidata. So we are dependent on um, Wikidata for some other, um, for some geographical information. So it's not representative of the, of the whole, but it gives you a sort of sense. And the same is true for the other maps I've shown you as well. While we've used um, the records of the Society of Antiquaries, the Royal Archaeological Institute, and the Congress of Archaeological Societies to give us names and um, some indication of work in archaeology, history, and heritage. We've also used a range of other archives. On this list um, are some of the key linked archives that we have used in the project, which are associated with the women we found in our core records. These records have enabled us to trace not only the range of women's work, but also their educational achievements and, for example, support in suffrage. Um, alongside the archives that are listed here are a whole range of other materials that are available digitally, such as historic newspapers and other periodicals. And those are also um, sources that we incorporate into the entries that we have um, been constructing for the women in our database. So having given you an overview of, of how we approach things and, and the kind of data that we are um, pulling together, I want to turn now to some case studies to begin exploring the lives of a few of the women in our database. Some of them you may have heard of before, but some may be totally unfamiliar to you. And I want to start with Sigrid Magnuson, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing her name 
correctly, and I'm probably not. Um, but Sig Ritter is one of the women who came up in our um, in our archive search relatively as a relatively early woman who appeared in the records of the Royal Archaeological um, Institute. And um, on the 6th of June, 1889, um, it was noted in one of the, the Institute's minute books that, and I'm quoting, the secretary reported that he had received a request from Mrs. Magnuson of Cambridge for the use of the Institute rooms for the purpose of holding an exhibition of Icelandic works of art, um, end quote. And I put on this slide, um, the notice that appeared in the archaeological journal relating to this exhibition. Um, the RAI uh, agreed to host the exhibition, as you can see from the slide, um, but they had a number of caveats which appeared in the minute books, including that they would bear no responsibility for the organization of the exhibition or any expenses related to it or responsibility for the safety of the art artifacts exhibited. So this is really um, Sigrid or Magnuson's uh, responsibility. All of that was her responsibility. Um, and a review of the display in the St. James's Gazette gives us a few more details. The display was dominated by Viking era jewelry alongside uh, carved wooden boxes, saddles, woven cloths, and more. Um, some of the items were for sale, as Sigrid or Magnuson was actually fundraising to improve education for girls in Iceland, which is where she was from. Uh, the Pitt Rivers Museum's Rethinking Pitt Rivers project provided further details on the afterlife of Magnuson's display, which was open um, for about two months. We've linked to um, the Pitt Rivers project um, as a source for our entry on Magnuson, which um, uh, is, is our way of, of sort of highlighting that, that there are connections between our work and other research projects. Uh, and the Pitt Rivers' um, project noted that Augustus Pitt Rivers bought several items from the exhibition, which were incorporated um, into the museum's foundation collection. We can only get a sense of the range of Magnuson's activities by keeping track of her many names. This is one of the most important things that we do across the project is try and figure out all of the iterations of um, names that women have, because that is a way that we can track their work um, and find it um, in various sources. Um, so we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I think eight different names for Sigrid or Magnuson. Um, her name in particular is quite um, complicated because you can see that it has um, several different spellings. Sometimes she's known as Mrs., sometimes um, Madame, and the um, the uh, the shortening of Madame also. So we really had to to try and kind of capture every single different kind of name that she was represented in the sources as having in order to um, make it clear that she could appear under all of these different titles. Um, and that, that was a way for us to indicate the fact that she, um, that she was known by all of these different names and you can find her in the sources by all of these different names. And each name gives you a, a sort of another clue as to the work that she was doing. Um, so Sigrid Ur Magnuson was born in Reykjavik in 1831 and she uh, married a fellow Icelander Eric Magnuson, who became a librarian at um, Cambridge, and that's where they settled. But um, Sigrid or Magnuson didn't necessarily stay in Cambridge all of her life. Uh, she traveled abroad on several, several occasions, um, and particularly to the United States. And so a number of the names that you see here were names that appeared in American newspapers because she took um, trips to the U.S., um, she took her um, collection of uh, Icelandic material to display at the Columbian Exposition, which is uh, the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. And um, she also took it on a loan exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York 
1894. So during that period in the 1890s, she was really doing um, some substantial traveling in the US. The Columbian Exposition, as it happens, also brings together a number of other women in our database, as you can see in this slide. Um, not all of these women were present at the exhibition, although Sigrid or Magazin was present, um, but their work was presented. And so a couple of people on this list, uh, were their papers were read at the, ex at the exposition in a Congress, um, actually a number of Congresses, um, as part of the, the World's Fair, there was this sort of uh, a plethora of associated congresses and um, a number of women's papers are read at, at some of these conferences. Um, and uh, it also gives you a sense of um, the range of disciplines that we have represented. So we have folklorists, uh, a couple of folklorists, um, an artist who's also an archaeologist, Margaret Stokes, um, and uh, some Egyptologists. Um, and it, I should also say that um, one of these women is American. So um, again, like Sigrid or Magnuson in our database, we have women who were um, who are appearing in records that are here, but their stories aren't necessarily British stories, as it were. Um, Georgia Leonard is um, was based, I think, in in Washington D.C. Um, and she was uh, an Egyptologist, and and she appears in the um, the records of the Royal Archaeological Institute, I think, as well. Um, so in linking and kind of uh, showing the, the connections at the World's Fair, um, what we're trying to do is capture a range of public presentations of women's work. So this includes things like international congresses and conferences and World's Fairs, but also other kinds of public engagements, um, such as historical pageants. So in 1911, for example, Sigrid or Magnuson and two other women in our database, um, Sophia Lomas, who's a historian, and Alice Gunn, um, who was a folklorist, were all historical advisors for a pageant that was put on in London as part of uh, the Festival of Empire. And um, Magnuson was advisor for the section on Vikings, uh, naturally. Um, so I want to turn now to Nina Layard, who I'm sure is familiar to a lot of you. But I want to talk about um, continuing this idea of women um, doing things in public. I want to talk about another key site for the public presentation of work by women in Britain, which is the annual meetings of the British uh, Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, Nina Layard is uh, well covered in terms of key encyclopedias. She's on the, um, the diction in the Dictionary of National Biography. She has a Wikipedia entry that's quite extensive, and um, she's on Wikidata as well. Um, uh, she became a member of the British Association for the Advancement of Science in, in the 1880s, late 1880s. Um, two years later, she was presenting the first of what would be 10 presentations she would give at the British Association annual meetings between 1890 and 1926. She's also one of 35 women um, so far in our database who were presenting their work at um, annual meetings of the British Association. But in the 1890s, she was also involved in the work of one of the British Association's research projects, which was an ethnographic survey of the United Kingdom, a project that blended archaeology, anthropology, folklore, and ethnography. Um, this initiative uh, was um, spearheaded, if I can put it like that, by a, a committee of representatives from the Society of Antiquaries, the Royal Anthropological Institute, and the Folklore Society. It's significant in showing how Layard was noted for her participation um, in a national interdisciplinary research scheme. And this initiative was promoted by the Congress of Archaeological Societies to its subscribing society members. Um, this slide gives you a sense of the information the ethnographic survey was proposing to collect, which was grouped into four different areas as shown on the left-hand box. Um, it ranged from measuring people's physical features to gathering information on folklore, place names, and mapping sites. It highlights 
I think, some of the more disturbing elements of 19th century science here. It also highlights the intersection between folklore and archaeology, as one of the questions in the folklore section deals directly with stories um, attached to specific remains. And information was sought on the location of a number of different kinds of remains, some of which you can see uh, in the box on the right. So in Ipswich, uh, Layard was involved in a local committee gathering information for the survey, serving as the committee's honorary secretary. An 1896 uh, report that was published in the British Association's uh, annual um, report on the British Association's work noted that in Ipswich, and I'm quoting here, Dr. Hetherington has furnished 20 measurements of individuals, a report upon which has pr been prepared by Dr. Garson and will be presented in a future report. Dr. Groom, Dr. Partridge, and Mrs. Ledger have also contributed through Miss Layard collections of the local folklore, and these will also be contained in a future report. So you, you can see that Layard is involved in um, assembling information for this ethnographic survey specific to Ipswich um, and the local committee that was that was working on survey work there. The records at the Society of Antiquaries also illuminate how women like Layard interacted with the society before they were admitted as fellows. So there are letters from Layard in the society's correspondence collection, including one to William Hope, in which um, she announced discoveries that were being made during drainage works near the old town wall in Ipswich uh, in 1900. She also turns up in the records of the Congress of Archaeological Societies, and she became a member of its council in 1919. And you can see her listed here on the right-hand side um, uh, as attending a council meeting. And um, one of the other people who's listed here, um, Edward Brabrook, Brabrook, was the chairman of the Ethnographic Survey Committee at the time that Nina Layard was involved in it. So again, we can see that the value of the records um, in the archives of the society for illuminating intellectual networks. Nina Layard is also related to four other women in our database. And families um, are other are another of the layers that we're trying to use to connect people across the entries. Um, like Nina Layard, Janet Birch shows up in the records of the Congress of Archaeological Societies. She was originally from Yorkshire, but she is one of over 40 women we have identified as students at University College London. At UCL, Birch took the matriculation course in 1902 and then entered into the um, Bachelor of Science course with a focus on geology. She is one of five women in our database who are residents of College Hall, which you see pictured here. Um, College Hall was opened in the early 1880s as a residence for women undertaking higher education in London. Most of the students at College Hall were attending either UCL or the London School of Medicine for Women. Um, College Hall was meant to be a very supportive and collegiate community. It had a very small number, relatively speaking, a small number of students who were resident. Um, and um, it had a sort of a general encouragement for students not just to um, embark on studies, although they were um, they were not admitted unless they had a serious program of research, but also to, to take advantage of the cultural uh, capital that is London. So the records of College Hall, which are held at Senate House, are a very illuminating source uh, of information on student life. During um, Janet Birch's time at the Hall, for example, residents were given tickets to the gardens of the Royal Botanical Society and the Zoological Society for use on their, um, their time off, as it were. And these tickets were provided by um, Thomasine Lady Lockyer, who is one of the founders of College Hall, and she's also in our database. Um, the College Hall Old Students Association records show that Birch was affiliated with the Hall long after she stopped 
living there. Um, and it's also clear from the records at College Hall that Janet Clay um, Birch, as she became, intended to study for a degree as I said, but she got married in December 1904, and this seems to have interrupted her studies as she was no longer listed as a College Hall resident after, um, after 1904. But we found evidence that she achieved a master's of science, but it's not clear at the, at the present time what institution awarded her this degree. And that's one of the, um, that's, that's a sort of regular problem we have with, uh, with the way that um, our research goes is that sometimes we know that a woman got a degree, but we don't necessarily know where she got it. By the 1920s, um, Birch was living in Surrey. Uh, she um, started doing a lot of excavation work in Surrey in the early 1920s, which is noted in records relating to the Congress's Earthworks Committee that I introduced you to earlier. Um, the, Earth the Earthworks Committee set up in the, the first years of the 20th century to gather information on local on a local level about earthworks. And they issued a, a sort of schedule of classification of earthworks as part of the remit. And within um, five years of its creation, it was issuing this annual report, which, as I said, included sections listing county, <coughs> excuse me, county by county across England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland, information relating to the preservation, destruction, and excavation of earthworks. Um, the reports also included a bibliography listing recent publications relating to earthworks. So this slide shows you an example of an earthwork committee form. As it happens, this one is filled in in 1912 by W.G. Collingwood, who um, is, is a sort of representative uh, of the Cumberland and Westmoreland Archaeological Society. But it shows you the kind of information that the, um, or the, the format uh, in which the information that is uh, published in the Earthworks Committee reports, comes in in raw form, as it were. So um, this form asks for information relating either to earthworks or fortified enclosures. It included, included um, a question about what has recently occurred within the, within the last reporting period um, relating to preservation, destruction, and excavation. And it depended on um, local correspondence from societies subscribing to the Congress to report, to fill in these, these reports annually and send them along. So um, one of the uh, local correspondents from societies to the Earthworks Committee that we discovered was Maud Cunnington. She was um, the local correspondent for Wiltshire. So information about Janet Birch's archeological excavations in Surrey would have been included on a form like this. Um, she worked on a range of different sites, including excavations at Wallington, um, artifacts from which came into her personal collection and were exhibited by her at a meeting of the Beddington, Carshalton, and Wallingford Archaeological Society. She was also involved in the excavation of a medieval pottery um, kiln at Cheam. And the report on the Cheam excavation noted that Clay was responsible, sorry, Birch was responsible for assisting with the excavation and putting a lot of the pottery back together. Um, she died in an accident, in uh, a car accident in 1929 and an obituary um, for her that was published in the Times indicated that it was due to her efforts that the Cheam kiln site was discovered in the first place. Um, the obituary also indicated that she was responsible for artifacts from Cheam being sent to the British Museum. Uh, the British Museum does indeed have Ch Cheam kiln pottery um, acquired in 1924, which is just the year after um, Birch is noted as, as being involved in the site. Um, the museum's collections online list a donor as the Onyx Property Investment Company. Um, this company were landowners of the site, so Birch's association with the pottery, which she had been directly responsible for piecing back together, is completely invisible in the publicly accessible record. Um, she is actually listed as a donor in the um, in the museum's collections online, but it's uh, because she donated her uncle's collection, which the museum acquired in 1927. Um, you can actually see some of the team pots; they're pictured in collections online. If you're if you're curious as to what they look like, um, Christine Toms is a relatively recent addition to our database. 
Like Janet Birch, she is acknowledged for her work in the Congress of Archaeological Society's Earth Earthworks Committee reports, um, working along with her husband, um, Herbert Samuel Toms. Um, this is unlike Mrs. Birch, who, whose husband wasn't, as far as I can tell, involved in the world of archaeology at all. Um, but it was through her husband, um, H.S. Toms, that Christine Toms began her archaeological life, for which she is largely credited as Mrs. H.S. Toms. Um, thanks again to the Pitt Rivers Museum and the research that has gone into Augustus Pitt Rivers' networks, it was through a notice about Herbert Samuel Toms that we were able to gain information on Mrs. Herbert Samuel Toms, um, and particularly to give her a first um, name and a maiden name, and a little bit more um, information on her backstory. She was born in Brittany um, in France, but came to the UK at some point and um, entered domestic service in the household of Augustus Pitt Rivers. And this is, uh, again, thanks to the Pitt Rivers' um, research projects on Augustus Pitt Rivers. So um, Christine Toms is one of the very few working class women we have in the database. Um, we do have a, a few others, um, but there aren't very many as far as we can tell. Um, Herbert Toms, who was, um, as the Pitt Rivers research project indicated, one of Pitt Rivers' protégés um, and he and Christine Toms got married in around 1905. She begins to appear as a donor to the Brighton Museum um, shortly thereafter. Um, her husband was the curator of Brighton Museum at the time. Um, as time went on, she is credited um, often by her husband directly for uh, collaborating with him on survey work, particularly in relation to barrows and earthworks in um, Surrey. Sorry, Sussex. Um, she also developed her own expertise and began lecturing publicly about her own heritage and the customs of Brittany. Um, this slide shows one such presentation, uh, a paper on the manners and customs of Brittany, which she gave to the Brighton and Hove Archaeological Society in 1923. Um, this a uh, particular uh, picture on the left here comes from um, an incredibly valuable reference book series, um, which is called the Yearbook of the Scientific and Learned Societies of Great Britain and Ireland. Um, the yearbooks, which were published from the 1880s onwards, comprised a list of lectures for a wide variety of um, different scientific and learned societies in the UK. Some of them are national, some of them are, are quite um, local. So using various digitized text searchable issues of the yearbooks, we've been able to trace lectures but given by over 30 women in our database, including Christine Toms. Um, these lectures might be in societies affiliated with the Congress of Archaeological Societies, but they also include smaller institutes and clubs whose journals aren't available digitally or the journals no longer exist. Um, so it's a, an incredibly valuable research, resource for us to see the kind of um, the scale of women's public presentations um, across the UK. Uh, I also um, recently posted on social media about finding Christine Toms in the yearbook. Um, and in a heartening um, example of the value of social media, um, uh, we got some response back um, about Christine Toms and her sort of longer legacy in Sussex. Um, and this included a, a photograph of her. And the number of photographs that we have of women in our database is very low. So it was incredibly exciting to be able to put a face to a name, as it were. Um, last but not least, as our case studies, we have Marjorie Venables Taylor. Um, like a number of other women in our database, uh, Taylor was the daughter of a noted local archaeologist. In her case, uh, her father was a noted local archaeologist in, in the Chester area. Um, she uh, went to Somerville College. She studied modern history, and she started working for the Victoria County History shortly after leaving Somerville in 1903. As uh, John Beckett's work shows, there were a number of women working at the Victoria County History, uh, we in Beyond Notability have over 20 of them in our database, but there are many more than that. 
some of uh, the women in our data in um, sorry, some of the women working for the, the Victoria County history had gone through Somerville. And uh, they were brought to the attention of the editors of the VCH through the efforts of the college's principal, Agnes Maitland, and also through um, Frances Haverfield, uh, who was writing the archaeological sections of several county histories for the uh, VCH. Um, this is a picture of um, one of Marjorie Venables Taylor's letters in the VCH archive. Um, and um, this has been an incredibly valuable resource for us in the project um, because it shows uh, in quite a lot of detail in most cases the, the incredible amount of labor that went into um, the construction of the VCH's um, histories. Uh, one of the things that comes through most strongly in uh, Marjorie Venable Taylor's correspondence is that she was very concerned about money. She carefully negotiated her salary with um, the VCH editor, William Page, and that's something that she continues to do as through the course of her time at, at the VCH. And actually, you can listen to an audio recording of an extract of one of her letters, um, in this case relating to later salary negotiations, which we put out, put out on International Women's Day um, 2022, and you can find that on our blog. So, the uh, then 22-year-old Marjorie Venables Taylor began working closely with uh, Frances Haverfield, um, who was already known to her and her family. Um, but a letter from Haverfield in the VCH archive from the 21st of July, 1904, outlines what he was expecting from um, an assistant, which is what Taylor uh, began uh, working with him as. And it was uh, working with directly with him in Oxford, reading relevant publications, working on, in his words, um, quote, ferreting points which arise, um, end quote, and um, writing up and working independently around his schedule. Haverfield explained in this letter that he had already kind of tested um, Taylor's abilities to fulfill these requirements and found her a suitable candidate. And she was actually replacing his previous um, se male secretary. While she was working with Haverfield, uh, Taylor was also fielding inquiries from a number of other Somerville students on the possibility of, of work with the, the Victoria County history. Um, and that's something also that comes across in her correspondence with William Page, who was the editor. The letters in the VCH archive enable us to understand Taylor's association with the city of Oxford as well, um, noting how she moved around the city living at different addresses over the course of her um, life. We turned this information into a team walking tour of Taylor's Oxford, stopping by several of the addresses from which she wrote letters to the VCH. Uh, at 37 Broad Street, for example, which was a formerly a university lodging house, um, was destroyed in the 1930s to build the Weston Library. And um, Taylor shared rooms with another VCH worker. So there's a certain sense in the letters of something of an Oxford-based based community of women who are all working for the, the VCH. Um, one of the other addresses on our tour, 44 St. Giles, um, connects Taylor to the English Folk Dance Society. So while she was living there, she was the um, honorary secretary of the Oxford branch of the English Folk Dance Society. So to connect us more closely to the uh, Council for British Archaeology, um, we come to 1943. Marjorie Venables Taylor is one of a number of people attending a meeting at the Society of Antiquaries, and this is part of the report from that meeting. Again, it's part of the Society of Antiquaries, uh, Congress of Archaeological Societies Archive. Um, it charts the wartime beginnings of the Council for British Archaeology as um, uh, essentially a creation of, a con of the uh, Congress, as it says. Um, later on, the archaeologist Brian O'Neill described the CBA as, quote, the child of the Congress. So you can see the very close association of the Congress of Archaeological Societies and the Council for British Archaeology. 
This slide is from, um, again, this the Congress of Archaeological Society's minute book, and it shows some of the attendees at this meeting in the, November 1943. And I've just pulled out the names of the women who are there on this particular page. It's a multi-page um, list. Um, so it shows um, the the names, some of which I'm sure will be familiar to you, Lily Chitty and Kathleen Kenyon, um, notable names here, but they're representing uh, local societies um, at this meeting. Marjorie Venables Taylor is there at the bottom, representing the Oxford Archaeological and Historical Society. So all of the women who are on this, this slide are listed in our database. And I put them here to show you that women were there at the at this, um, the birth of the Council of British Archaeology, um, and also before it, because it comes out of the Congress. Um, and of course, in 1949, Beatrice Ducardi started her role as the, um, the Council's Assistant Secretary. So to draw this to a close, I hope I've shown you that there are stories to be told about women in archaeology, looking beyond a few notable names. There is a wealth of information to be found in local archives and connections to be made to material that's held in national societies. I hope this has been an inspiration for you all to think about how you can bring stories like these to the sites that are nearest and dearest to you. And over the past year, we've been working with a brilliant storyteller who has crafted four stories for us on five women in our database. One of the stories will be about two women who are associated with Hadrian's Wall. Um, the artist, Jessie Mothersole, who, for those of you who followed Neil's walk along the wall last year, you'll remember um, Jessie Mothersole because he was retaking her pictures. Um, and Elizabeth Hodgson, who is based um, uh, close to Hadrian's Wall, who's intimately involved in excavations along the wall in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and a key member of the um, Cumberland and Westmoreland Archaeological Society. So you can see these stories being performed at our International Women's Day event on the 8th of March. Uh, places are still available online, and I hope you join us. And um, thank you so much for having me. That's it. <laughs> thank you so much, Amara. Uh, that was absolutely fascinating. I've scribbled down a 50 gazillion questions of myself <laughs> from that, but I'm uh, going to try and read some of the questions out now to you from what people have already asked. So somebody's asked, would the project extend past 1950 or would that be another project for the future? That would be another project for the future, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> we have, we have, um, more women than we can possibly handle now. So <laughs> it definitely would be a different project. Somebody um, uh, was wondering that they'd been searching the database already for an individual that they knew about called Hilda Paston um, and they couldn't find that individual. Uh, so I guess that was kind of merging two questions really. Can people get in touch with you with regards to entries and can they help you um, populated the database with women that they know of that have contributed to archaeology? Um, so we don't, we haven't covered every single woman. That's, I should say, our 800 women is not the total of women in archaeology during um, the period that we're, we're discussing. So there will definitely be more women than we can possibly <laughs> cover. Um, and so I'm, I'm absolutely happy to, um, to have emails about about more women. We are a very, very small team. So um, there will be limited things that we can do, but I'm hoping that what this does is inspire you to make those stories visible in your own way as well. Um, so this was like kind of like my own question really. It was like, it's quite obvious that these women were very active in their fields. Uh, can you see a definite moment of exclusion, especially with regards to the public legacy of their work? I think the thing that um, the thing that happens is that most of the women who 
are doing things in archaeology are not necessarily the people who are associated with the final sort of product, <laughs> if you like. So they might be credited in a report, um, but barring the, the people who are like directors of digs and so on, um, those people who are not the director tend to be excluded from, uh, from how we remember the excavations in the sites and how those sites have been kind of remembered through time, at least on a, on a broad level. The other thing I think that's important is that a lot of women are not necessarily publishing their work. So they're presenting on it, um, but, but beyond the title, the, the sort of the labor that's there in the presentation isn't um, there in a sort of longer lasting form. So that again is a, is a way that they are that their work is is now invisible, and um, it's really only the um, the sort of archival work that makes that hidden labor so much more um, so much more present, I suppose, because you get in a in the archives you get a sense of the activity that's happening that isn't the final publication because really that's that it's the publication that is um the thing that that will last so for example if someone um is part of a site like my example of, of janet birch if she's part of a site and she's responsible for doing things with the artifacts but it's the company who owns the land who's credited on the on the label uh, it's that kind of exclusion that happens. It's the sort of the infrastructure that makes the, the work invisible, if that makes sense. So it's all, I suppose the equivalent is if you're working on a commercial site today, the person who would have their name on the report is the person whose legacy that you would really see. I mean, you would be included on the list of contributors in the acknowledgements, but you wouldn't necessarily be pulled through as like the main. Yeah investigator I suppose yeah yeah and also I think the um the the wider publicity that happens around um archaeological excavations is very ephemeral it happens like you have the season and you maybe have your your um presentation at the end of the season or during the season uh and then if the the excavation shuts down that's it you know um, unless there's a publication that comes out of it and, and there are complexities with how women are credited in publications um, unless they're writing it themselves. So it's the ephemeral nature of, of the kinds of work that happen in archaeology that is the problem, I think. Uh, there's another question that's come in that kind of links to what we've just been talking about. Do you think this presents an opportunity for us to rethink how we record excavations to include stories and experiences of people undertaking the archaeological research? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I think it's one of the things that is, I suppose, worth thinking about is a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the source material that we find that's the most rich is, is like newspaper reports. <laughs> And, and it's it's about how archaeology cultivates a relationship with the media, right? So um, in we're, in the period that we're interested in, part of the infrastructure of archaeology is that it's dependent on public subscription, mostly. And so you have, I think, a more um, a, a vested interest on the part of the archaeological team in making the the findings more visible so that they can get subscriptions to continue doing things right and that's also about um about cultivating the right people and and being in control of the narrative and so um i think it's also thinking about the relationship with media that we have and and who um and how archaeology is re represented in media that um that can shape the way that we think about archaeology and the, and the people who are doing it. The, uh, the other thing that struck me as well was the socioeconomic status of the women. Do you think that a lot of those women were able to participate at that level because of this? Yes, 
<laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I think um, we're talking broadly speaking with uh, about women who are on some level able to sustain work for not very much money, if, if any. Um, I should say that um, it's very clear that women were interested in being recompensed for their labor, like Marjorie Venables Taylor was definitely interested in getting paid. And <laughs> rightly so. Yes. Yeah. Um, she was not prepared to work for no money at all. Um, and I, you know, she she's she's not coming from a working class background at all. But she, but I think um I wouldn't want to say that just because women come from a middle class background means that they're not interested in getting paid, because that certainly wouldn't be true. And a lot of the other um, uh, something I haven't really talked about is that women are writing about archaeology and history for commercial publications as well. So, um, and that's another level and layer of the invisibility of archaeology, because if you're writing for a popular magazine, for example, you might get paid for that uh, magazine contribution, but it's also now much harder to um, to sort of associate that popular magazine publication with your name. Because for example, the ADS doesn't keep track of articles that are published in you know popular magazines, broadly speaking. Um, so if you publish an article in um, the Pall Mall magazine, <laughs> it won't be listed in the ADS, but it might be your, um, you know, P piece de resistance about your archaeology. So it's it's also about the venue in which um, women's work appears, and the fact that that those publications might be commercially and financially quite useful for them, but now those publications are not um, considered to be the the sort of venue that you would publish your research in, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um... So there's an uh, interesting question. Do we know why there was great contribution by women at this time? Um, women obviously still play a key role today in the sector. Um, I suppose wondering why I suppose how it why archaeology attracted was attractive to them or you know, was it a trendy thing at the time, I suppose, to be interested in? Um, I mean, I think that I think the interest in in the past has kind of is always kind of always there so if you're um if you're living in a particular area and um something comes up that is that is a sort of archaeological discovery say either you make it yourself or it's something that's already happening um it's part of 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 your curiosity about the place that you live in and the and the past of the place that you live in i think and uh, that that it kind of doesn't matter what time period you're living in for that to happen. So um, I think it's it's women who are curious about the past and and um and able to pursue that curiosity that's really driving the interest in archaeology um rather than it being a sort of trend. Um, and it just so happened that there were local societies where women were um able to to get involved and and be a part of projects. Um, and present on on work that they were doing, and also women who, um, who had access to, um, sites and and other kinds of materials because they were in the family. <laughs> that's you know, <laughs> that's part of it. Um, there were a number of women who are who are working on sites that were, um, attached to houses that they lived in. So, um, yeah, it's it's partly kind of general curiosity, but also I think driven by circumstances, family circumstances that that enabled them to get involved. I'm gonna try and squeeze in two very quick questions now. How do you think this research is influencing the way we encourage, promote and support women and other underrepresented groups in archeology span today? Well, I hope that, um, that by showing how many women are involved, <laughs> um, it can um, it can it can prove to be a place that is um, 
not exclusive. And by kind of going through the archives and seeing how women have been able to um, integrate themselves into learned societies, even if they're not members of the society, there are ways that women can get involved and ways that women can become quite notable, like within the context of that society or, or locality. Um, and that happens throughout the period that we're interested in and before and obviously after. So, but it's about making that that broader context more visible so that people can see, oh, it's not just me. It's not just the people that I know. It's also people before me who have um, been able to do things. And, and I think one of the things that's been um, enlightening for me is to see how many women who on the surface of it, you know, like we were just discussing women who, uh, who have these kind of either quite well off or, or um, comfortable lives are advocating for themselves mm -hmm. in a way that is quite, um, it was surprising to me, I think that they were prepared to be so kind of blunt about asking for support and so on. Um, so I think it's, one of the things that I hope is a takeaway from this project is um, is to kind of try and get beneath the surface of people's lives and and understand um, what things they do on a personal level to advance their careers, and that's that's quite I think um, helpful as <laughs> as a person who who is interested in um, pursuing um, an interest in the past. It's it's helpful to know that other people have gone before and not just pursued that interest in the past, but also made sure that they were able to sustain, uh, you know, um, to sustain and advance themselves in that career. Okay, one last question, and then that, <laughs> and then we'll all finish. What was the what What's the most surprising discovery from your research? Oh Lord, um, surprising discovery. Um, I think it's, I think it's persistence, if I can put it like that. So, um, we have this woman in the database who, a Marie Brown, who like Sigurd or Magnuson wrote into the society, uh, or to the Royal Archaeological Institute and was asking for their support in organizing an exhibition. Um, and one of the, one of the nice things, I suppose, in looking across data sets is that you can see um, women popping up and asking the same question at multiple places. So um, Marie Brown wrote not just to the Royal Archaeological Institute, but also to the Society of Antiquaries. Um, and you can just kind of picture in your mind this lady sitting at a desk, writing with a pen, saying, please, can you help me organize this ex exhibition? I want this, that, and the other thing, you know. And um, I think I think the surprising thing is that so many of the records give you this fantastic image of someone um, embarking on their work. Um, and and it just, it's, it, it kind of takes you and kind of sucks you in. <laughs> and so, and, and I've been, I've been dealing with archives for a long time. And um, I think, you know, it's, it's, in a sense, it's not surprising that an archive can do that. But it's um, the the fact that it sucks you in is always surprising, if I can put <laughs> it like that. It's just it's like a constant um, barrage of of visuals that you get when you're, you know, even if it's a really dry record, sometimes it can be really illuminating and um, and or you, you're making connections between different kinds of records and that kind of builds up this picture and it's great. They're just hidden stories, aren't they, I suppose? Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been absolutely fascinating and brilliant. Thank you for sharing your research. But how how can people kind of follow, obviously, the database, but you're on social media as well, aren't you? Yes, yes. And, um, and do sign up for our International Women's Day event. So we've got lots of brilliant speakers and, of course, the four stories that we've been um, working on with, uh, with our storytellers. So do come. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure.